Morning, Glory America. Bonjour. Hi, candidates. Friday, July 23rd. I'm Hugh Hewitt in the Beltway, and it's getaway day for Hugh. I'm going on vacation with the Fetching Mrs. Hewitt for the next two weeks. Kurt Schlichter will be in next week. The following, Mark Davis and Ed Morrissey will be in. I'm sort of going on vacation. I'm going to California to prepare for an August 4 debate at the Nixon Library, which I will moderate along with uh, Alex Michelson and Christine Devine of Fox News Channel 11, Ambassador Robert O'Brien, who's co-chair of the Nixon Seminar, and five of the uh, many candidates who are going to replace Gavin Newsom. Uh, Larry Elder, my former colleague on these airwaves, uh, will be there. Kevin Faulkner will be there, former mayor of San Diego. Kevin Kiley, state senator in uh, in California, Doug Osi, former congressman. John Cox, who is the nominee in the uh, 20... And the last time Gavin ran for governor and thumped John, but these are the five that uh, have passed the criteria of the Nixon Library. Caitlyn Jenner also passed. Caitlyn Jenner is Australia. Team Jenner can change their mind and tell us that Caitlyn Jenner will be back for the debate and there'd be a six podium put on the, but we're not doing the empty podium thing. Uh, that The five are what we need. They're, as far as I'm concerned, uh, Caitlyn Jenner would get on because of name recognition, but uh, these five will provide a great debate. And I talked to Alex Michelson about it last night on Fox News 11 in Los Angeles. And uh, I'll talk to Christine. I talked to Ambassador O'Brien about it as well. California's problems are many. They are teetering on the brink of disaster. They are teetering on the brink. Mass mandates are back in Los Angeles. They don't know what's going to happen with the schools. Uh, the crime wave is astonishing in places like L.A., Proposition 47, which decriminalized theft, has led to a lot of people doing a lot of thieving that had not previously happened uh, because it decriminalized theft up to, I think, $950. There are issues of plenty, but the reason I left the state five years ago, taxes, and uh, it's the reason why California has, for the first time since the census began to be taken for California, declined in population over 10 years. So it will be an important debate. Mark your calendar. There are not going to be any tickets, friends. Uh, I'm sorry. Don't start calling me up and asking me for tickets. I'm just a moderator. The room is only so big. It will be full of cameras. It will be carried statewide on the Fox News channels, uh, uh, the various affiliates, Fox News 11, their San Francisco sister station, etc. But I guarantee you, I will play lots of it for you on the air. I also... I don't know if Larry Elder is calling in this morning. I talked to his campaign manager last night. I said, get him out of bed. You know, I know it's four o'clock in the morning in California, but I can tell you we have an 11 share in San Francisco and a similar share in L.A. and San Diego at this hour. And I don't know. It's really hard to get people out of bed at four o'clock in the morning. Yesterday, Kevin Falconer got out of bed at 5.35 or so to do the 5.45 segment on The Hugh Hewitt Show. But mark it down, that was how my day was spent. And so my, my vacation, I'm using air quotes if you're not watching on the YouTube uh, stream, my vacation is going to be getting ready for a big debate. And by the way, I will be neutral. Uh, Larry's been my friend for 30 years. We're in the talk radio business. Uh, but I am uh, I'm a pro. Alex is a pro. Christine is a pro. Robert O'Brien is a pro. We will simply ask questions about the state of California and what they will do if they win. Remember, there are two questions on the ballot on September 14th. Should Gavin Newsom be recalled is the first question. He's invited, by the way, to the debate. He's invited either to be on the, the stage with the five other candidates, Elder and Faulkner and O.C. and Cox and Kylie, or he can have a separate debate because he's a separate question with the same four panelists at 5 p.m. Debate's going to be at 6 p.m. or 6.30, I, I can't remember which. Uh, and the governor can come earlier, so that's up to him. I hope he comes. I think he should come. It would make a lot of sense. Let me do the rundown for you very quickly. Japan Olympics kick off amid a cascade of disasters, according to the Washington Post. The first line of the story is, the Olympic Games are about to begin, but who is actually excited? It's a pretty good summary. The athletes are excited. Their families are excited. I'll be excited to watch occasionally an event like the, uh, the 1500 is one of my favorites. Um, I, I love the 400 relay. I, there are some things I like that are unique. Um, I'll watch a little swimming. As I recall, it's swimming first week, track and field second week, but no one in the stands, really. I, you know, I don't understand it given the vaccines have been around long enough. 
There is both too little and too much attention being paid to the virus in the United States. Too little attention being paid by people who are at risk. That is everyone who doesn't have a vaccine. I heard my friend Charlie Kirk say there's been a sudden decision by the center right establishment to push the vaccine. I don't, first of all, he's talking, I think about Sean Hannity. Uh, Sean's not center right, Sean's conservative. I have been pushing the vaccine since the day the vaccine was available. And I have been warning about the virus since the day that I saw the first report out of Wuhan. I am one of those so-called alarmists who saw it all coming. And if there was a Pulitzer given out for coverage of the Wuhan incident and the virus, generally I would win it. There isn't because they don't want to recognize that. But Tom Cotton was the first to the bell. I was the first on the media. And I'm the first to tell you, you should get this vaccine. It may save your life. Uh, But I will also cover breakthrough infections. Why vaccinated people are getting breakthrough infections is a story in the New York Times today. And uh, a wedding in Oklahoma leads to 15 vaccinated guests becoming infected with coronavirus, writes a uh, a poor of Mandeville. Well, that could happen. You might not even know you get it because once you've had the vaccine, very, very rare that anyone who gets the vaccine, who gets the virus after vaccination even knows it or has anything other than a sort of a mild cold. Less than 1% of fully vaccinated people in the District of Columbia have contracted coronavirus data shows. Okay, that's the Washington Post this morning. So if we can extrapolate from D.C., which is, um, you know, of course, it's heavily African-American city. So the black population is probably overrepresented, but I, I don't know who's got the vaccine here. But of all the people who got it, less than 1% uh, apparently get coronavirus afterwards, breakout infections, as they're called. 31 children tested positive for coronavirus at summer camp. Guess what? None of them got sick. It's because it does not impact children except in rare cases. That's why children aren't being vaccinated right now. That's why, for example, there will be no masks in Florida. Ron DeSantis yesterday spoke to us. Cut number one, the governor of Florida on the questions of masks and school kids. We look forward to this upcoming year uh, to be a, a normal school year, uh, be in person and, and, and live like normal and, and learn like normal kids. Uh, there's been talk about potentially people advocating at the federal level imposing compulsory masks on kids. Uh, we, we're not doing that in Florida, okay? At the end of the we're day, we're not doing that in uh, Florida, we we're start- not doing it anywhere. Uh, that I have anything to say with it because it's silly and it's stupid and it doesn't work. Uh, Kids touch their faces. Kids take those masks off. Have you ever seen kids with masks? It's just not a very smart thing. Uh, I also want to run down the fact that a booster shot is likely to be necessary. It's going to be signaled by the uh, CDC's advisory group. U.S. median home price hit a new record in June of $363,300 as sales increased 14% year over year on strong demand. President Biden is going to be the kiss of death for Terry McAuliffe in Virginia. By the way, uh, Glenn Youngkin is on the show today after either Larry Elder calls in or doesn't call in. Glenn Youngkin is calling in. He knows he's got to win. He's got to be here. NFL teams, they're going to be obliged to forfeit if a game can't be played because unvaccinated players cause a COVID-19 outbreak for the team. That's smart. The Intel CEO says the chip shortage could stretch into 2023. So much for your new cars costing less, Mr. President. How much will your Oreos cost? Companies test price increases. Inflation is everywhere. I no longer eat Oreos, though I love them. I'm sorry to hear that kids everywhere are going to have to pay more for their Oreos. And then U.S. is expanding the effort to relocate Afghans at the risk of Taliban vengeance. Good, good, good. They are airlifting tens of thousands of Afghan interpreters and their families to our bases in Qatar and in Kuwait so they can be vetted for repatriation and settlement in the United States. That makes sense, especially in the areas where the Taliban threatens to come over. Uh, let's come right back. I got lots more. I'm hoping Larry Elder joins us. He's going to be I, right now. He's the front runner in the California recall. He'll be at our debate on uh, August 4. I talked to Kevin Falconer yesterday. Glenn Youngkin is coming along. I think he's the front runner in, in Virginia. Josh Kroshauer, Dr. Larry on the Hillsdale Dialogue. It's Friday on the Hugh Hewitt Show.
Welcome back, America. It's Hugh Hewitt on a Friday. That means Sunny Bunch. It's a truncated Sunny Bunch today as I have Detective Tom on hold, Larry Elder, a, uh, Larry Elder in a holding pattern over the show, Glenn Youngkin behind him. But we've got to get our movie fix from Sunny Bunch, the official movie critic of the Hugh Hewitt Show. Sonny, I'm holding in my hand the Comfort of the Ruthless podcast official mug. It's called the Friend of the Program, like Friend and Ally of Rome. When is Sunny Bunch across the aisle going to get an official mug for merch? We should we should have some merch. I don't know what sort of merch we would have though. Uh, you know, it's hard to it's hard to mer- merchandise being you know good good friends at the movies. I, there are only I, two things. There are only two things. One is a coffee cup, like the ruthless coffee cup, which I hold my hand if you're watching on the uh, YouTube, which has friend of the program misspelled and then ruthless on the front. Or everybody loves those uh, big coffee things. What are they called that that are you know, the coffee never gets cold. Yeah, the, uh, like a, a, a Yeti or whatever. Yeti, a Yeti. A Yeti, sure, yeah, sure. Yeti. So that, it, you just, across the aisle, Yeti. I, I, I'd put that, you know, that could be a product placement in the Hugh Hewitt show. We'd like that. Sure. I'll, well, I'll see, I'll see what we can do. So what's on the agenda, Sonny? We're running at uh, double speed today. All right, so we had uh, we, we, we mentioned this last week, but uh, the new Anthony Bourdain documentary, Roadrunner, uh, that is that's out in theaters now. It's an HBO Max production, but it's out in theaters. It's not it's not on TV yet. Uh, co-produced with CNN, I believe. Um, uh, we 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 again we briefly mentioned that uh, it's it's an interesting documentary in that uh, it, there's some controversy surrounding it. The, the well, yeah, is it deep fake? Is it is it real? Yeah. So so there's there 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 are two separate controversies. The first I think is kind of a controversy frankly. The 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 deep fake issue. Basically what the producers of the documentary did was they took some lines that Anthony Bourdain uh, had written in emails and uh voiced them via, you know, uh, an AI produced uh, dialogue uh, that 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 Bourdain, you know, quote unquote, read right. So basically, they took all of they took all of Anthony Bourdain's appearances on TV, all of his, uh, you know, podcasts, all of his, you know, books that he read, and fed it into a computer, and then had the AI create, uh, you know, readings of of lines from his emails. I, I get it's it's a little bit weird. It's a little bit creepy, but it's not really. Actually, I'd like to hear how it sounds. That's kind of an interesting science experiment. Yeah, I mean, well, the the weird thing is they don't really tell you in the in the movie when the deep fake is being used. That would be kind of nice to know. But like it, again, it it's not it's not the end of the world for me. This is not, not this is not not a, not a killer for me. What's a killer for me is I don't care about food. Well, there's there's that. There, yeah. is, there is a bigger there is a bigger controversy though here, and this and it's this the the, the documentary in the last I don't know twenty thirty minutes of the documentary essentially implies that his relationship with Asia Argento, who was a uh, his 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 last girlfriend, his last you know true love, whatever, um, his relationship with Asia Argento is what kind of pushed him over the edge into suicide. Um, she you know he had kind of an addictive personality. He was super into her. She ended up leaving him, and when when she was with another guy, it was all over the tabloids. It was very hard for him to take, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it it this this isn't. I mean, look, it's it's it. Maybe it's true. Maybe it's maybe it's not. I don't know. It's a documentary. It has a point of view. It doesn't have to be like pure journalism. But what what's weird is that she was not interviewed for the documentary, and they interviewed all sorts of people. And not only was she not interviewed, she was not asked to be interviewed, which I think is a no. That's odd. That's odd. I think I, I think you I think you if you're going to if you're going to imply that she was one of the reasons that he uh, that's died, ridiculous. That in he, fact, that that he killed himself, then I think you have to at the very least ask her for comment. I, yeah. I just like again, documentary, not journalism, doesn't have to be. Fair doesn't have to be totally even-handed. Doesn't have to be even really open-minded. No, but I do think that it be, it no. betrays a lack of seriousness. Oh, a lack of curiosity. Yeah, a lack of interest. And 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 I think that's a, I think I think that is a much bigger sin. That is. I'm not going you know. to it. What's next? All right. Up next, uh, out in theaters this week, the new M Night Shyamalan movie. Ooh. M Night Shyamalan is back. Old. 
Uh, here's the here's the elevator pitch for old. A family goes to a beach and ages, ages, <laughs> it was fifty years in a day. Fifty years in a that's 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 the pitch here. It's a uh, it's what a twist. There's all there's all sorts of you know weird things happening. I don't want to see that either. It's a horror movie, Hugh. You're not going to enjoy it. Uh, I I went to see it last night. So the 15 year old becomes me. Yeah, the uh, there's a. Uh, I don't so, want to see that. I don't okay, want to so see what I look like at 15. Period. You should have <laughs> seen the clothes in the 70s. It's a, it's a family of four: uh, mom, dad, little, little boy who's six, uh, little girl who's about 12. Uh, and after you know four hours on the beach, he is the the little boy is uh, 16. The the girl is 20 something. Uh, and they're they're just they're aging too fast, Hugh. They're aging too fast, and every everything is all sped up on this beach. The wounds heal instantly in in a matter of moments. Uh, Did it occur to anyone all, to get off the beach? Well, they try to get off the beach, Hugh. They try to get off the beach, but the, the beach won't let them leave. They they get uh, headaches and they black out when they try to leave the beach. And you know they, oh, there are okay. several they ways. They remade the Prisoner series when the Gant McGowan from the '60s. Okay, the, 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 the bubble similar. comes and gets them. Yep. Similar, similar. So the, uh, the, the, you know, look, it's, again, it's a horror movie. You're not, I know you're not super into horror movies. The Nem Light Shyamalan movie, I know. Not at uh, all. Never. Are you, people, did you like it? It's okay. It's That's a sunny but You know it's, what, Sonny? We're going to put It's Okay on your tombstone. It's, it's okay. No, it's, it's a very silly movie. It's a very, very silly movie. It's very over the top. It's very, um... Oh, I don't, I don't know exactly uh, what the best adjective is, uh, but except to say that it is, it is extremely uh, silly and over the top. And very, All right. Sonny, uh, I got to talk about you for a minute. That last week I told my wife to go see Pig, and she said why, and I said because Sonny Bunch loved it. He said he loved it. I said, well, Sonny Bunch usually says either it's fine or it's okay. So when he says yeah. it's the best movie of 2021, that means it's really out of the park great. But I do think. On your tombstone, it's fine, it's okay, Sonny Bunch. Well, well, but this is the thing, you most movies exist within a spectrum of fine or okay. Yes. Most movies are between two to three stars on a four-star scale. That, that's yes. Just, that, that's the meaty part of the curve. And uh, that's why and, you're a good critic. I, I mean, it, I'm just completely non-discriminatory, except for horror movies. I love everything, and that's why I'm not a critic. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I really do strongly believe that you have to accept a movie on its own terms. And on its own terms, uh, you know, old is is a perfectly acceptable time at the movie. It is again, it's ridiculous and it's silly and it's over the top. And I think a lot of people that. are going to are going to really enjoy. It, but I, I think a lot of people are also going to think it's it's kind of dumb. Um, remember the happening? Do you remember the happening, Hugh? The happening was of the M. The Charlotte happening, movie and you'll find, that's like a 1962 song, though. The happening. Yeah. Uh, if I had a producer, we'd play it for you. The uh, the that movie was also very silly uh, and not very good, and I think this is a little bit better than that, but it's very much in that vein. So if you remember the happening and you, you thought that was dumb and you didn't love it, you're probably not going to love this either. I'll, I'll throw Sunny that Bunch, thank you. It's fine. It's okay, but I'm not going to see old Sunny Bunch. Joined now by the poet laureate of the Tarzana Joe. Wait a minute, it's not the Tarzana Joe show. It's the Hugh Hewitt show, and he's Joe Tarzana Joe. So I thought it was a coup. A silent, uh, clandestine takeover. You, uh, first, I'd like to make a public service announcement. Well, it's, it's more of a self-serving announcement. My website was uh, hacked last week. So, so I if, told uh, people. If anyone was trying to request a poem and didn't hear back from me, please reach out again. Do you know what happened? Has anyone told you yet? Uh, it was uh, kind of a, it uh, took the form, the I want a poem form, and generated a poem request every 30 seconds. That was Dwayne. See, Dwayne has <laughs> got to pay for the backyard, so he was trying to hijack your poetry commission. He can't even rhyme. I thought for a minute there that it was going to be a really good week, and then it just didn't <laughs> stop coming. So. <laughs> Is it fixed? Yes, it's fixed. Yes, it's People fixed. can still write him, Tarzana Joe at Reagan.com. What do we have this week, Joe? Here's what we have. I'm asking you this question because I really want to know. Are you better off today than you were six months ago? Is your bottom line improving? Do you think that, by and large, you feel confident to say that someone competence in charge? I know that other fellow was obstinate and mean, but he sure knew how to keep the lid on pricey gasoline. Do you feel you have a platform where you can air your views? 
Has there been an overemphasis on ice cream in the news? Do you like it when he whispers? Do you find it condescending? Are you pleased with the efficient way the crises all are ending? Are you worried for your safety? Are you worried for your rights? Does crime in your community keep you up at nights? I know you found that other guy boorish and abusive, and some of you like government to be somewhat intrusive. Is the FBI transparent? Is Congress to be trusted? Do you turn on cable programs and then turn them off disgusted? Well, these months sure weren't boring. You might even call them thrilling. And I'm sure we'll make another six. Certainly. God willing. I've got questions. By Tarzana Joe. God willing, the creek don't rise and the hacks don't hack. Yes, well. Well, you know, Joe, that will be over at TarzanaJoe.com, correct? Yeah, you bet. And Unless it's working nemesis, again? It nemesizes me again. All right. Now, now tell me, one of the, it wasn't ransomware, was it? They no, didn't it hold you just, ransom for poems? No, absolutely just malicious. Just All right. You know what? That's called denial of service attacks. They must not have liked one of your poems, Joe, but that's yeah, still but kind of extreme. Uh, people can get their poetry needs met, Tarzana Joe, at Reagan.com. Any of the recall candidates asked for an official poem yet, Joe? Uh, no, I did write a, a campaign uh, rhyme uh, last time around for a candidate in the San Diego area, but no, I haven't had an official recall poem. Well, well, remember, if you do one, you must do any that ask. Otherwise, it, this will not be the neutral and fair forum that it is for everyone else. Well, I'm, what is there, uh, 62 people running? I'm Something right. like that. <laughs> Tarzana Joe at Reagan.com for all your poetry needs. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, you. Welcome back, America. Hugh Hewitt inside the Beltway on this Friday, July 23rd. Joined by Glenn Youngkin, who is going to be the next governor of Virginia. Good morning, Glenn. How are you? Welcome back to the program. I, I can't hear Glenn. Uh, so they all, just a second, Glenn, we'll pick it up. In the meantime, I'll, I'll do the setup here. Um, yeah, your sound is muted on your end, Glenn. So uh, let me know when they unmute you. Uh, I, I want to talk morning. to Glenn. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Oh, good me. morning. There you are. You know, Zoom has changed all of our, if I ever do a Zoom call that comes off 100% correct, I will be amazed. How you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. The race is going extremely well. I'm in a dead heat with Terry McAuliffe, who's been doing this for 43 years. And uh, Virginia voters are ready for a change. I think you're actually ahead, uh, uh, Glenn Young, and I'll tell you why. Dan Balls had a story in the Washington Post this week that polling is broken in America, systemically understating Republican support. So if you're tied in the polls and you are, I actually think you're five points ahead of Terry. And I think Terry's worn out, tired and boring. And I don't think he can beat you anyway. But uh, it's good to run like you're behind, right? Yeah, it is. You know, what's interesting is as soon as the polling came out last week, he, he called his friend Joe Biden and Joe Biden's going to show up in Virginia campaigning. He's not coming far. He's just coming barely across the river. Um, and I will tell you what this demonstrates is that Terry's got a failed record. I mean, when he was governor, the murder rate went up 43 percent. We're at a 20 year high in murder rate in Virginia. He's actually completely ostracized in the entire law enforcement community, and they know he won't stand for them. And Virginia's economy continues to trail all of our peer states, and everybody blames Terry and, and uh, Ralph Northam for it. They shut down our economy. Terry absolutely didn't bring the number of jobs to Virginia that our peer states did, and Virginians are tired of it. They're ready for a new kind of leader who's going to build business, grow jobs, fix our schools, and uh, make our communities safe. I, I, I agree that you've got a great platform. I want to bring up this, this visit from Joe Biden. You've also got the hometown paper against you. Uh, the Washington Post sent out Sean Sullivan to cover this, and I've got the story in my hand. They do not mention you until paragraph 26, I count it. Biden will launch into campaigning with visit to Virginia in support of McAuliffe. And 26 paragraphs in, after quoting Biden, after quoting uh, Terry McAuliffe, after quoting Senator Robert Casey, they finally say that his uh, Republican opponent is Glenn Youngkin, a wealthy former private equ equity executive. Terry McAuliffe is also a wealthy former private equity executive. I just think it's funny how bad the, the post is in the tank for Terry McAuliffe. Well, the great thing is Virginians aren't paying any attention to it. Uh, as I try, continue to travel around and campaign all around this Commonwealth, the crowds are huge. 
The support is absolutely comprehensive. It's independents, it's Democrats. You know, I was at an event uh, about 10 days ago in Russell County in Southwest Virginia, and a bunch of Democrats came up to me and said, Glenn, we can't even recognize our party. They're so far left, we're voting for you. So we're seeing this everywhere, and that's why we're so confident we're gonna win this fall. By the way, I think President Biden is kind of radioactive because of the inflation. I wanna to talk to you about that. Chairman McAuliffe in this article I hold says he's got senior citizens on his side. Senior citizens are the most vulnerable to inflation of any group in the United States, Glenn, because many of them are on fixed incomes. What do you hear about inflation in Virginia? Because I see it in the grocery store. I'm wondering if you see it all over the state. It's, it's everywhere. Uh, Joe Biden has let the inflation genie out of the bottle. And we're seeing uh, supply chains and every business actually increase prices. We're seeing labor rates, of course, go up. And that's translating into higher cost to all Virginians. And by the way, it's not, it's not just our elderly population that's gonna suffer from this. It's families that are in fact having to pay more at the pump. I mean, gas prices are way up. And, and in fact, the Democrats in, in Virginia actually raised the gas tax on top of gas prices going up. And so we're just absolutely seeing this complete split between fiscal responsibility and, oh, by the way, a recognition that a good, strong, stable economy actually is durable. And what they've created in Washington is gonna be a flash in a pan economy and Virginians are gonna suffer as a result. So when I'm governor, we're actually gonna get the job machine turned back on. We're gonna actually uh, bring real business back to Virginia and we're gonna actually get small business going again so that in fact, we have a durable economy so Virginians can, can have the kinds of lives and careers that they want. President Biden also submitted a budget, Glenn Youngkin, that cuts in real terms defense spending. Virginia is a heavy defense state. It's a heavy military state, whether it's uh, the special facilities near D.C. or the port down in Norfolk and Virginia Beach and everywhere in between. Uh, how does McAuliffe run away from the fact that Democrats spell disaster for defense? Well, they do spell disaster for defense and he can't run away from it. And on top of that, when he was governor, he actually said he would diversify Virginia's economy and he didn't. Uh, and in fact, you know, what we saw was our peer states in Tennessee and North Carolina and Maryland and South Carolina and Georgia absolutely grow their economies substantially faster. They actually created many more jobs. My opponent runs around and talks about the fact that he created 200,000 jobs. But let's be clear. Terry McAuliffe didn't create any jobs. Businesses create jobs. And had he created jobs at the same pace as our peer states, he should have created double that number. I mean, he is like a basketball coach who was really excited that his team scored 60 points. And then he looked at the scoreboard and saw that his opponent scored 110. And he's like, wait a minute, we just got our butt kicked. And this is what Virginia has suffered from with leadership from Terry McAuliffe and Ralph Northam for the last eight years. And this is why we're going to change this. We're going to go compete and we're going to win. Uh, so, Glenn Young can talk to me a little bit. You began on crime. I want to end up on crime because uh, when I'm talking on the California recall, the number one issue is schools, second issue is homelessness, and the third issue is crime. I think maybe it's different in Virginia. Crime might be number one, but you tell me of those three. I think the crime rate has got a lot of people uh, very concerned in the Commonwealth. Without a doubt. Uh, as I said, we're at a 20-year high in murder rate, uh, and everyone looks at this and recognizes that when you in fact demonize law enforcement and don't invest in law enforcement and have policies that are gonna further, further deplete law enforcement capabilities. I mean, Terry McAuliffe has looked at everyone and said, I'm gonna get rid of qualified immunity. So he's finding another way to personally bankrupt law, law, law enforcement heroes. And we're just not gonna have that in Virginia. When I'm governor, we're gonna invest in law enforcement. We're gonna make sure that they have the training. We're gonna make sure that they have the equipment and we're gonna make sure the qualified immunity is preserved we're gonna to have to increase compensation for law enforcement, we just need to. So we can have the best qualified folks actually pr uh, protecting all Virginians. We're gonna stand up for them and that's gonna be the key to actually reestablishing safe communities in Virginia. Finally, Last question. You, I don't, I, I don't wanna miss, miss this, which is you mentioned education. And education yep, that's continues to be sp uh, top of the list for so many families. And we watched the Democrat leadership keep our schools unnecessarily closed in Virginia. I remind, I remind all the listeners that Virginia was ranked 50th in freedom back in March. Our schools were unnecessarily shut for an extended period of time. We're actually watching critical race theory actually move its way into all schools across Virginia and families are just not gonna have it. So we're gonna get our schools open. We're gonna make sure critical race theory is not taught in our schools. And we, in fact, are gonna press forward with school choice to give families an option 
Virginia only has eight charter schools in the entire Commonwealth. And uh, North Carolina has 190. And Maryland has over 100. And here's, here are Virginians with no choice in schools the education unions are back in Terry McCall if he, in fact, has said that he'd get rid he'd get rid of our right to work status. And all of a sudden, all the unions pile in. And his largest donor last month was the besides the uh, Republican uh, the, the besides the Democrat Governors Association was the was the uh, NEA. And the, the education unions are piled in because they know that he will do their bidding. And Virginia families deserve so much better. Our schools should work for our children. They should work for our families. And we have so much to do here, and I can't wait to get it done as the next governor. Uh, the, the question I was coming to is CRT, because the Loudoun County controversy has been on the networks all the time, and people wonder about the Loudoun County controversy. You will put a stop to that? You will put CRT into the, into the deep well it deserves to be in? Yeah, a- absolutely, Hugh, we will. And in fact, we all know that what critical race theory does is divide our kids It actually forces them to see each other through a lens of race every time they address any topic. And it's the exact opposite of what we want to do. And we're always reminded of the great words of Dr. Martin Luther King, where he said, we want to we want to judge each other based on the content of our character, not the color of our skin. And here all of a sudden we have teaching philosophies that are really a political agenda to actually drive racial division as opposed to bringing people together. And we're going to push it out of our school system and have a have a, a fact-based civics curriculum that yes teaches the good and the bad. We're not going to try to actually hide the abhorrent history in in Virginia and our country, but we absolutely have to recognize that a political agenda is not an academic curriculum, and that's why Virginia schools are suffering. And we're going to get this fixed when I'm governor. Uh, so, uh, Glenn Youngkin, what's the website as we close up here? Uh, it's youngkinforgovernor.com. And uh, we have great momentum in Virginia. And by the way, Hugh, one of the things that has been most encouraging is this is not Republicans against Democrats. This right. is Virginians standing up against the left, liberal, progressive set of. Up oh, your Zoom froze on us there, Glenn Youngkin. Uh, yeah, your Skype froze, but we got most of it in. Youngkinforgovernor.com. Youngkinforgovernor.com. Thank you, Glenn. 